Good morning. Good morning. It's lovely to be with you again this morning. The psalmist wrote, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me to live by your truths and to walk in your paths. In communion with all believers everywhere, we come to worship the Lord our God and to learn from him. Let's open our service by listening to our opening hymn of praise, Lord of Creation. Lord of creation to join together in prayer. Let us pray. Generous, hospitable God, who turns no one away, welcome each one of us now and embrace us with your love. Help us to set aside the concerns of our everyday lives and rest in you, knowing that you love us and hear us when we pray. We come into your presence, humbly seeking your mercy. We come rejoicing for your love for us is steadfast. We come in confident hope, knowing that you will guide us in the truth. We sometimes think that the more we have, the happier we will be. We sometimes turn the other way, closing our eyes and ears ignoring what we see. Merciful God, forgive us for the times when we have given in to the temptations of our world or turned a blind eye to the things we know are wrong. Forgive us when we have denied your authority and gone our own way, when we have not been true to you or the values you have asked us to own. For the times when we have been so focused on our own concerns that we have failed to recognise the needs of others. When by word or deed we have hurt others 
and grieved your heart. Forgive us, Lord. Renew and restore us. Help us to focus on your will. Support and guide us to follow where you lead us and to do what you would have us do. These prayers we bring in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you are our shepherd. We thank you that you give us everything we need. We thank you that you offer us rest and refreshment through your word. That you keep us on the straight and narrow when we are prone to stray. And we thank you that those times when we are afraid, we can trust that you watch out for us. Provider God, you have given us so much of yourself in your abundant love and grace. Bless us with a vision of a better world for all and hear us as we pray for those who are hungry and for those who are left out in the cold while others reap the benefits of a society based on greed. We think of those who are homeless or displaced, those who are exploited, those who are poor, there are many who cannot enjoy the beauty and mystery of creation. We think of prisoners of conscience and those living in war-ravaged lands and those confined through illness. There are many who yearn for rest in lives which are restless in heart. We think of those who work long hours for little reward and those who are discontent and disillusioned. We pray for those who struggle to find the right path because life has taken them a different, difficult route. And we think of those with addiction problems, those who turn to crime through desperation, and children whose home life is chaotic. We pray for those who are fearful for themselves and for others. We think of those in broken relationships, those who live with sickness, those who are afraid of the future and of being themselves. We think about those who have lost hope that light will ever penetrate their darkness, those who live with loneliness, grief, bereavement and rejection. We remember before you those who we walk alongside in their pain and suffering, their joy and hope, 
we think of them now in our time of silence. Lord God, shepherd all your people on their different journeys with their different joys and struggles. Remind them all our honoured guests at your table and that all may find a home in you. Lavish them with your goodness and love so that they might know that in you they have everything they need. Sovereign God, come again to our broken world and grant your healing. In the hope of Christ we pray. Amen. Lord our God, as we come now to study your word, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus entered Jerusalem, greeted by crowds of people waving palm branches and shouts of Hosanna. He went to the temple where he turned over the tables of the money changers and drove out those who were buying and selling. Those who were blind and lame came to him and he healed them. The next day, when Jesus returned to the temple, as he taught, a group of chief priests and elders came to him, demanding to know who gave him the, the authority to do these things. When the police finally caught up with the man, they took him to the police station and sat him down. Then the questions began. What were you doing in the street at that time of night? What right did you have to be in that house? Who did you see? Why were you so worried when we came to find you? The question they really wanted to ask was, did you commit the murder? But they couldn't ask it yet. They needed to come to him with a barrage of other questions to get the man talking, to get him to tell the truth, or so many conflicting lies that they catch him out. The question the chief priests and elders really wanted to ask Jesus was, do you think that you are the Messiah? It was the Messiah who would have authority over what happened in the temple. Jesus, this country boy from Galilee, had walked into Jerusalem's holiest shrine and acted as if he owned the place. So it was natural for them to ask him who gave him the right to do these things. Jesus' reply is a master stroke. His answer is a question designed to put the chief priests and the elders on the spot. And that question certainly caused confusion. The chief priests and elders didn't want to offend those who believed that John the Baptist was a prophet but they couldn't bring themselves to admit that John's authority became from God. That would have raised questions about their own behavior. So they replied, we don't know. The question about John is the clue to Jesus' answer. John, as you remember, had baptized Jesus. And we remember that after his baptism, Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah and confirmed as God's beloved son. If the Jewish leaders had really understood what John had been doing, they would have known the answer.
to their own question. In telling the parable of the two sons, Jesus presses home his point. The first son who said no to his father and then changed his mind stands for the tax collectors and the prostitutes who believed that in John and repented. The second son who said yes to his father stands for the chief priests and other leaders who look as though they are doing God's will but refuse to believe John's message and repent. The hypocrisy of the chief priests and elders was highlighted by the fact that they knew the right answer to the parable, but they were living out the wrong one. Our reading today highlights the, atten the tension between the authority that comes from being in a position of power and divine authority. The chief priests and elders had positions of power under the Roman overlords and could make decisions on matters of religion, economy and the law. But were they following God's law? Jesus taught a different way of living and his parable is a challenge to all who claim to be following God's laws but in reality do not, who say the right things but whose lives do not reflect the will and the love of God. In his letter to the church in Philippi, Paul speaks of humility and clearly identifies Jesus' authority. That Jesus always had the nature of God, but did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death on a cross. What about our identity? Where does it come from? We are made in the image of God, who has been made known to us in Jesus. And through our commitment of faith, we have identified ourselves as God's children, brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul tells us that the same focus on God and his will that was in Jesus should be in us and challenges us to act in the interests of others, to put the interests and welfare of others before our own. Does this include putting the interests of our planet before our own. As creation time celebrated by the church in the month of September draws to a close, creation is in crisis. With fires of unprecedented scope and ferocity, a speeding up of the rise in sea levels and the melting of glaciers, rising temperatures resulting in severe droughts and increase in the number of hurricanes and tidal waves and of plastic waste which causes so much damage. The destruction of the environment and food sources for many species. And now the coronavirus wake up Call. The emergence and spread of COVID-19 highlights that the more we become involved in the exploitation and consumption of wild creatures, for example bats, the more we will become infected by the viruses that they carry. 
These things warn us that the current way of life of those living on our planet, with their damaging use of the world's resources and neglect of creation, is unsta unsustainable and destructive, not just to human life, but to the life of so many other species which God has created. Jesus gave up all he had to save us. How might we put aside what we want for ourselves in order to protect our world and give others what they need? Looking to others' interests instead of our own is a bit like sharing out a cake. Perhaps as children, when a cake was handed out, we might look at everyone else's portion to see that no one received a bigger piece than ours. As adults, when cutting a cake to share, we might be keen to ensure that the pieces we cut are equal and fair for all. What would our community be like if seeking justice for others was as important to us as justice for ourselves? The mandate to care for our world is part of the covenant which God made with his people. If we buy cheap cotton t-shirts that keep poor people working in sweatshops, and degrade the environment when we could actually afford to buy ones that last longer and are fairly traded. What does this say about our attitude to others? Paul's letter is full of love for the Christians in Philippi. He tells them how happy they would make him by living like Jesus. To have the mind and attitude to God and others that Jesus had. Living in a way that is right with God often means making changes in our lifestyle in the interests of others. Has living through this pandemic made us more considerate and more aware of the needs of others? During his briefing last Monday, the Chief Medical Officer, Professor Whitty said, you cannot, in an epidemic, just take your own risk. Unfortunately, you are taking a risk on behalf of everybody else. And he reminded us that wearing face masks, social distancing and washing our hands are simple but very important things to do to prevent the virus spreading to the most vulnerable in our society. Our ancestors made a covenant with God who put us on this earth to care for all he created. Jesus demonstrated compassion for the poor, the sick and the outcast, putting the needs of others before his own. And we have promised to follow him May we strive to keep the promises we have made by demonstrating our love for our neighbour and striving to protect and preserve all of God's creation. Amen.
now as we leave this place, let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord our God and care for all he has created. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit be with us and all those we love, wherever they may be, now and always.